If you want to know how variables work in make.com, then this video is for you. We need to go to tools. We can get a variable and we can set a variable. Now here we've got the two main options, get and set. And then we've also got two additional options to get and set multiple variables at the same time. Let's first have a look at setting a variable. We can set the variable name. Here we'll use test as our variable name. You can put whatever you like in this field. Then for the variable value, normally you would map that from a module, but you can also put in hard text here. So I'll just put a number into that value. And under the advanced settings, you've got variable lifetime. Now how this works is we've got two options, one cycle and one execution. Now you only really need to toggle this option if you're using multiple cycles in your scenario settings. So if you were to go down here and put a number greater than number one, then this advanced feature allows you to hold variables from one cycle to the next cycle within one execution of the automation. One execution is if we've scheduled this automation to run at 9 a.m., then it will execute at 9 a.m. today. But we could say, run this same scenario five times starting from 9 a.m. So that means now we have five cycles. With this option, we can set a variable to be maintained across all of those cycles for the entire execution, or we can hold it for just one cycle. By default, it just holds for one cycle and for 99% of your use cases, that will be all you need. So now we've set our variable. We can run this module and we'll see the data being saved as our variable. You can see the mappable value here is test. And then the output of that value is one, two, three. Now, if we want to get that value later on in our scenario, we would need to use the get variable module. We would put in the same variable name that we've mapped. So test is the name of the variable. And then when we run this scenario, we will then set the variable to test one, two, three, and then we'll get the test variable, which gives us the result of one, two, three. Now, Normally you won't put it in a line like this because there's no real point to setting a variable and then getting it. You're just really using operations when you don't need to use them. Normally how you would use variables is with a router. With a router, we can see that we will take route number one and in this route, the output will be us setting a variable. Then later on in another route, we may want to then fetch that variable to then pull some information from the first route into the second route. Now, this is very commonly used for when we need to create or update something. Quite commonly, there won't be a, an upsert module. Now, an upsert module allows you to create or update the same thing in the same module. So that means that if we try and create something like a subscriber to an email list, and that subscriber already exists in our database, well, then we won't create a duplicate we will update that existing record. And that's what's called upserting. Most systems do not have upserting functionality. And so you'll have to create your own functionality to search and see if you can find a record. And if you do not find a record, then you would add a filter here where the um, ID or row or bundle is not existing. Then you would create the record and you could then set the value. Then if you do find a record, you want to then update that record and then set the value. How most people do this is they will map a whole bunch of data in both of these modules. And that's a little bit tedious, particularly if you've got 20 or 30 fields. The better way to do it is to really lean into routers. And so here we search for the record, then we take the first route. If that record does not exist, we then add the row, we create the record. And when we create the record, we just create the one field that is our unique identifier. Most of the time that might be an email or a phone number, something that's unique to that record or contact. And then we set the variable for that new row that we created. If a row is returned from our search rows, then we map the ID of the returned row. So here we're either creating the row, then mapping the ID, or we're mapping the ID of the one that we found in the search. Then our data would come back to the second route, and now we get that variable. Something very important you need to remember when you're working with routers 
is that routers work in a sequential order of the routes. And as we add more routes, we get a numbering of our routes here. If we just drag and drop the order of the route, that doesn't change the numbering. You can see here it's still first, second, third, and fourth. And there's a handy little button here called Auto Align. And I recommend you click that to get the routes in the right order. And the reason for that is when your logic runs, the logic will always work in that particular sequence. See, it always takes the first path, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. And it waits here at the first until that entire path is finished. And then it comes back and then it does the next route that it finds. So if you are starting to stack up routers and filters and you're unsure on how data is going to move through your scenario, then you've got this explain flow button. And that allows you to simulate how data interacts with the modules and the order that it interacts with those modules. You'll see here that we always want to set the variable before we try to get the variable because the get is just reading what we've set. In this example, we're using it to actually switch out the value that we're setting in that variable. So here, the first path has a filter so that if this video record from the email exists, then we get the video, we get the video detail, and then we map the transcript of that video into our variable. If there is no video on the email, instead we map the keyword or text, which is the idea that we use to create that email. And that allows us to very quickly create emails and not have to actually write anything for the email. We can link it to a video in our database. That video then has a transcript. And with one button click, this logic then runs and allows us to then create the email from the transcript without having to add any extra information to it. So that's a nice, easy way to really lean into variables. In this example, we're fetching the latest stock price and we're using variables to reduce our API calls to our currency conversion module. So here we've got a filter. If it's in a currency that's not in USD, then we send that value to our currency requester and we convert Japanese yen or Australian dollar into USD. And then we save the output from our currency conversion or if it is already in USD, then we just map the result from the USD price. Here we then fetch either the original USD or the foreign currency that is then converted into USD. And then we write that into our database. And the purpose here is really to reduce the currency conversion API calls, because here we've got a strict limit on how many calls we can make with that API per minute and per day. Now, this is a slightly different way of using variables. Here we've got a scenario and we're mapping quite a lot of data into these ChatGPT modules. And to cut that data into bite-sized chunks, we're using variables to set sections of data that we then pass into the ChatGPT module. Now, the reason for that is because our prompt is quite long. And each time we want to change a particular section, for instance, some information about a business, we don't want to sift through 2000 words or so in the prompt, we want to just quickly find our variable that is related to that part in the prompt and then change that one section. This scenario is called from a bubble application and its main purpose is to duplicate data in a database. So this particular data comes across with dates as text strings. That's just how the API sends the data. And here we want to parse those text strings into a, a valid date format. So what we do is we set that as a variable. We then split it up into an array because it's a comma separated list of text as it comes in from the API. We then format each of those date values into an actual date that we can then read with the system. We then aggregate those dates back into a array, and then we save that as our new variable. Then we also save the timelines and the timelines also come as a text. And here we're splitting that list of IDs and creating an array by using the split function. We save that as a variable. And here we get both of those arrays. We then iterate the dates. And then for each date, we then iterate the timelines. Now we've got an iteration 10 times 10 
and we would create 100 things. Variables are also very useful to use if you're getting consistent errors in your scenario. For instance, formatting dates is a very common error. And if we try to put a value that is not a valid date into a format date formula, then it will throw an error. And this can potentially cause all the other mappings in a module to not map because one formula that you tried to do has broken and therefore that entire module breaks. Now, a good workaround for that, if you have things like dates, sometimes existing, sometimes not existing in maybe a form submit, then pull those things out into separate variables. Since if you need to map a date into a particular format or parse a number from a string and that string sometimes doesn't exist, it will throw an error in your logic. And here you could pull that particular field out, map it, put an error handler on the variable so that if that one field fails, then we just ignore that one field. And then here in the mapping step, we would just simply get our variables. And you can use the get multiple variables module here to save a little bit of space. And then you can map the variables that have cleaned up that data rather than the original data, which may be invalid for some of those fields. Now you don't need to do this for absolutely every field in your scenario, that's totally overkill. But if you are finding that some fields are erroring, then this is a nice easy workaround that allows you to pull out that field with an issue, potentially solve it with maybe some formatting or ignore it if it is not solvable, i.e. it's missing or invalid data and then continue on with the rest of the logic in this particular module that you're trying to map to. So let's put all of that together for variables. And here's a big scenario that shows you how you can use variables in multiple places to really simplify and combine lots of different streams of logic into your end result. Here we're storing a month value. And to get that value, we're just getting the current date. And then we're formatting that into a two digit month value. We do something similar with payroll year to then get two digits for year. We also store a variable here when we want it to interact with a test database, we just change this to anything other than live and it will then switch the two values here, which are the base URL and the API key to then switch it to our test database instead of our live database. We then use the variable to map into all the custom API calls, the base URL and the API key for either the test or the live database. Here we set a payment ID. This is used later on in the scenario to then map across to zero our invoicing platform and also create a payment in our database structure. And that just ensures that we only create one payroll record per employee per payroll month. And here in the logic, we're really leaning into variables a lot to calculate either a full month salary or a pro rated month salary if someone was to start or finish within the particular month. So here, if they don't have a start date within the current month, then we just map the start date as number one. If they do have a start date within the current month, then we extract out the start date from the start date from their position. And we do a similar thing for end date. If they um, don't have an end date, for the current month, then we just fall back to the last day of the current payroll month. If they do have an end date, well, then we want to actually write the end date from their contract. We figure out the days in the month. And to do that, we just get the payroll month. And then we just figure out whether it's a 31, 30, 28 day month, etc. And then we use that to then calculate the pro rated salary for these employees. So to calculate the prorated salary, we get the start date, which we calculated earlier. Then here we wanted to prorate it so that we're actually counting up the workable days, not all the days in the month. So for instance, they might start on the 15th and finish on the 30th, but within that time, there might be three weekends. And so we don't want to pay them for six days in the month because they would normally have not worked those days in the month. So here we just iterate through the dates and then for each date, we get and store the day for that particular date. And then if that day is not Saturday or Sunday, we then count up in our number aggregator. And so now it's a percentage of they worked eight out of a total 24 
workable days for the month. So therefore we will pro rata and adjust their monthly salary by that percentage. Here we calculate the bonus. We default the bonus to zero. Then we look up in the database, whether it's a monthly or hourly bonus and they hit their bonus target, then we just map in their monthly bonus. If it's an hourly bonus, then we do some more math. We calculate the number of hours minus the hours that they need to then reach that bonus. And then we times that remaining group of hours by the hourly bonus amount to then calculate their bonus. We store that in a data store as well. We then modify the base salary by the worked days in the month, if it's a partially worked month, to pro rate their salary based on that. All of those values are stored in data stores temporarily. And then we create the record in our payment database. So you can see here that leaning into and leveraging variables turns this very complex logic into fairly simple chunks of logic in our scenario. We can chunk things off, figure out little bits of logic at a time. And if, if we want to change or swap things out, we can put in some routers, put in some filters and adjust the logic as we go. And by chunking it off into variables like this, we can debug things a lot easier because we can very simply pinpoint, here's the variable, here's the value that was calculated. Is that the correct value? If it's not, well, then I need to change it in this particular variable, and then that will affect everything else in the scenario. So it's a nice, easy way to really simplify complex scenarios. This one here is some very complex calculation logic to calculate salaries and bonuses. And later on, they also get calculated into different currencies. And this business has hundreds of employees that run through this logic every month. So it's a critical piece of in infrastructure. And by using variables here, we make the scenario incredibly reliable and easy to debug in the future.